Hi everyone, just a reminder that this is part one of a two-part episode, so make sure you download part two. Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's July 7, 2017, and today we're at Oxford University speaking with two of the researchers involved in the project Understanding Buddhist Nationalism in Myanmar, Religion, Gender, Identity and Conflict in a Political Transition. So hello to Markin Mamaji and to Matthew Walton. Hey Luke. All right, let's get stuck into it. The research project is focused on understanding a very complex phenomenon in Myanmar, and one that has significant negative consequences for, say, millions of people. When the media talks about Buddhist nationalism, we see articles about firebrand monks, Buddhist terrorists, and widespread discrimination against non-Buddhists in Myanmar. But is Buddhist nationalism simply bad? What is it to you, and what misunderstandings is your research seeking to resolve? It's a really interesting question, I, and I, I, I like that you you put it that way. I mean, we sort of came to this topic together from from research programs into, on my side, kind of Buddhism and politics and a little bit of nationalism, um, and on Ma's side, sort of um, gender and a little bit of politics and increasingly some nationalism as well, and kind of brought this brought this all um, together. And I think you know we're concerned about violence that exists, violence um, from, from Buddhists against Muslims and others, and, and we're concerned about discrimination and all of those things that seem to be connected to this phenomenon of quote-unquote Buddhist nationalism. Um, but we also recognize that there's a lot more going on, and that's really what motivates this project. Um, you know, So we've been doing research over the last couple of years that kind of feeds into this more nuanced picture of, of what Buddhist nationalism is. And I think there's two aspects of that that we well, maybe three aspects that we particularly want to understand. One is that if we think about nationalism in Myanmar, um, we think about ethno-nationalism, we think about all the different ethnic groups, that there are attempts at this sort of Myanmar nationalism, right, for the whole country. But we know that that's a construct. Uh, it's something that mostly Bama uh, sort of culture stands in for. So when we talk about Buddhist nationalism, there are differences between the ways in which Bama Buddhists and Rakhine Buddhists, for example, would understand those nationalist uh, sentiments and struggles. So that's one aspect. The other is is the kind of um, relationship between Buddhism and nationalism. So Alicia Turner has done great work on this in particular in separating out the de- early decades in the first, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, where the sort of movement and the activism was mostly, um, you know, for defense of sasana, of the religious community, rather than the national community, which only kind of coalesced in the 20s and 30s. So that's a really important thing for us to look really carefully at what many of us, myself included, have always just said, oh, over the last couple centuries, you know, Buddhist identity and national identity has sort of intertwined. And we're trying to pick that apart really carefully to see sort of what is the kind of Buddhist motivation? What are the Buddhist motivations? What are the nationalist political uh, motivations? And then the final thing is that, you know, you look closely, you start to look closely at groups like Mabatha or the former Mabatha. These are groups that are deeply involved in social service work, religious work, teaching, education, all these kinds of things. Um, And so, you know, very little of the analysis has looked beyond those few firebrand monks like Wirathu um, to look at the fact that there's stuff going on with Mabatha and Mabatha affiliated groups um, on a daily basis that is sort of community building. It's positive. It's 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 stuff that people embrace. And and our suspicion um, is is that this is the way that many people in Myanmar sort of engage with and understand Mabatha, even if they reject some of the anti-Muslim narratives, or even if they sit uncomfortably with those. So we're really trying to kind of take these things apart and understand what is in this term Buddhist nationalism that we think poorly describes what's actually going on. there. So I, I myself is working as an anthropologist, but kind of my areas in, in looking back about gender in nationalist era. And I did my master thesis and, and my doctorate thesis, and I'm particularly looking at how religious nationalism impact on gender and gender construction. So that's a lot, that makes us interested in this issue, you know. So, and, but also increasingly, as you said it, uh, uh, and in your introduction, right, in the West, in particularly um, popular media poetry, 
you know, like, uh, you know, these extreme monks that actually exploiting or violating human rights mm. of peaceful Muslim, right? So actually, like, you know, you know there's like a very dichotomy term that, you know, like, kind of using and popularize in Western media extension of a lot of Western government, NGO, INGO, right? So like, and this popular, popularized this concept. Actually, in deep down, there's a like, um, there's much more complicated than that. And it is like, in a, it's a prolonged, you know, militarization, prolonged extreme nationalist construct that is like, you kind of producing certain form of identity and ideology that actually deeply held by Burmese. Today, in the Western world in particular, including Burma as well, and we have forgotten about the military departure. Military departure was just recently, just around the corner. Of course, like, you know, the, the military legacy on society is very strong. So there's a military legacy in a way that in the society is even much more deeper than like, you know, exploitation of materials from. Right, so like you know, everybody heard the assumption, belief, identities, and all that. But another one, my final point is that transition and globalization. And my Burma was up to 2012. They said like they are isolated wall. Burma was an isolated place that there's no connection to the wall. But it kind of opened it up door, mean that like you know, coming at all the you know, uh, 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 no information. Right, information knowledge that not necessarily true or correct because they come from social media, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, and so Burma is actually seeing this news, particularly Western media about Islamization, fear of Muslim, that that's actually like an influence to Burmese society. So, what happened is like now they they are facing their dream of democracy. But at the moment, not democracy yet. They're in transition period. And they're uncertain of their life, their future, their identity, their ideology, their religion. So that actually, like, you know, create a certain form of anxiety and fear and, like, you know, you know distrust. And also, and, and, and as I said, it's, like, influenced by, the, like, you know, you know, mainstream Western media, particularly on social media. So that's actually created, like, you know, and we are, we are a very good team. And uh, that's where we start to work on this proposal. The proposal is like, okay, you know, and Matt has been like working on religion and so deeply on political ideologies. And I'm working on Islamic agenda. And we think, oh, that's like you know, something we can see. Mm -hmm. It's something that like deeper than, you know, like what appear to be. So like, you kind know, of, it needs to be explored. It needs to investigate. So that's why like I kind of, you know, and a very good team, you know, like I you know working on very complicated, sensitive issues that we are working on. Great. You've touched on a lot of stuff there that I want to bring up um, later, but maybe we'll just start with something that thinking about the um, Western media portrayals, there's no kind of getting around uh, Ma Ba Tha. So maybe, uh, you know, detailed and contextual profiles of Ma Ba Tha, or as they are calling themselves now, as I understand it, the Buddha Dharma Parahita Foundation, are few and far between. So who are Ma Ba Tha? Where did the organization come from and how are they perceived by Buddhists and non-Buddhists? in Myanmar society. And it seems to be um, the perceived knowledge now that there is some kind of low point. Um, is that true? The Mabata is not what we found in the field. Is Mabata is not what we thought that there's like an extreme, crazy, firebrand monks organization. It is far from the reality. The reality is that they are, they are, yes, they are extreme. They kind of, they have like a kind of interesting and even more dangerous thing is that because they are, they, they are doing this because of they truly, genuinely believe in it, that there is a danger, their religion is danger, their identity is danger. Like, so they are justifying based on their belief and view that Burma is the last sources of, you know, like a last sources to defend Buddhism. So, uh, you know, based on that, everything they are willing to do, to an extreme, if you like, you know, like you know, under the name of defense of Buddhism. Yeah. And I think that means a lot of different things to different people, right? But what the defense of Buddhism is, how it is properly carried out, um, 
what are we defending Buddhism from, right? And so it's been most prominent in the discourse has been, you know, the threat from Islam, right? This sort of existential threat that, that we hear the most about, and that certainly the loudest voices associated with formerly Mabatha, like Urathu, would talk about that. But in fact, as you start to look at the organization's activities, there's just as much work going on internally. Internally meaning, you know, in moments of crisis, Buddhists turn to their own practice, to education of their children, to make it to, to you know, sort of purifying their own um, religion and their own community. And so much of what Mabatha, former Mabatha, does, I guess we should start really referring to it as, as the Buddha Dhamma um, Parahita Foundation, but... Um, but so much of what they do is oriented towards that. But I think the other thing that we're really starting to realize um, and that we're trying to, uh, you know, in the next round of field work really get to is um, the kind of conventional wisdom was that back in 2012 and 13, um, 969 was a, a really loose network, right? And 969 was really just a symbol that people could grab onto. And now Urathu tried to kind of formalize it a little bit more in his meetings with um, Sinhalese monks a couple years ago, but really that was a loose network. And, you know, Mabatha had already been formed by the time that Mahana, the state Sangha authorities, um, put their ban, and I'm making air quotes on this, on using the 969 symbol for religious purposes. Um, so Mabatha had already been formed by then, and you hear lots of different narratives about its formation, right? So one of the most common is that some senior monks uh, were really worried about what young monks like Urathu were, relatively young monks like Urathu were doing, the kind of negative press that Buddhism was getting. They weren't necessarily against this idea of Buddhism under threat, Buddhism needing to be protected, but they wanted to do it with some legitimacy, give it a good name, things like that, give it some authority. And so this is one of the prominent stories of Mabatha's foundation. Um, you know, which is why then you get these, these um, you know, big monks like in Saint Yuama Seira and Thirigu Seira who were involved from, from the early stages. Um, and so we always think about Mabatha in relation to 969 as being more centralized, more kind of hierarchical and organized. That's true to a degree. I mean, there is a kind of organizational chart to some to some degree. It does have different sort of chapters, but in fact, you start to scratch the surface and there isn't that much to former Mabatha as an organization. So, you know, a lot of the activities that get branded as Mabatha activities or that would get branded um, or that are connected to Mabatha are local activities, right? Local organizations, charitable organizations, Barahita groups, groups that are doing donation drives or blood drives or education work or legal defense work, all these things that sometimes have no official connection to the group, but are all part of this campaign, right, to protect Buddhism. And I think, I mean, I've described this as, I think what happened was, uh, you know, in the early years of the transition, 969 and then Mabatha in particular stepped into what I've called a religio-political vacuum, right? So it didn't mean that there weren't religious institutions there. There have been. It didn't mean there weren't political institutions. What it meant was that there were no organized voices talking about this sort of religio -politi these religio-political goals, these concerns about the religion articulated through political means. And I think Mabatha kind of cornered the market on that for several years, which is why we, we never heard the other voices, right? The monks who who were against the anti-Muslim violence, who were against this kind of framing. And so, especially after the 2015 elections, I think we've started to see the dispersal of Mabatha voices, right? So you started to see them, they were so effective in organizing around the four laws prior to the elections. That was kind of their reason for existence for a while. And that was, that's what brought everybody together. And then after those were passed, and then after the, some of their monks clearly got way too political in in the eyes of, of many Burmese Buddhists. You know, you started to see splits in, within Mabatha on, you know, policy questions. You started to see the emergence of, like, other voices. And we've seen that over the last year and a half. You started to see, under the NLD, occasionally religious and political authorities kind of taking actions or making statements, things like that. But still, what you've got is an incredibly agile and effective brand right, that can capture the defense of Buddhism in so many different ways, can allow space for somebody who just wants to focus on educational activities, right, to, to sit alongside somebody who is virulently anti-Muslim, to sit alongside somebody who could care less about the kind of 
protection of Buddhism from a religious sense and really is much more of an anti Mahana, anti Buddhist authority activist, right? And so you've got all of these different kinds of figures coming together. And I think one thing that our project will try to do over the next few months is really get a sense of organizationally how this group is working, especially in light of these recent changes. Because, um, you know, in the weeks before the Mahana order that required Mabatha to change its name, you also had the creation of, as Ma said, um, Dama Wuntanu Rakita, which was created as kind of like the lay, the lay group sidekick to do stuff that uh, monks shouldn't do, like file lawsuits and things like that. And then a few days after that, then you had the creation of this political party, 130, 135 Patriots. And, you know, so you have, you know, the kind of diversification of institutions and institutional branches that I think will be really interesting and important to track. We are we have been focusing on Mabata, Mabata, right? There is a lot of kind of much said rightly that there are many many things that Mabata again like you kind know, uh, and uh, uh, people as uh, organization that directly associated with Mabata or indirectly associated working with Mabata, such as certain of schools. The Ma school, Mahodara school, you know, like kind of so many, and also like microfinance. So there are so many, and youth projects, so many projects that, you know, like, you know, are existing inside Burma. And and this is also like, in you know, a somehow that the Mabadas or monks or youth who are associated with Mabada are working with the schools. And it's just so, it is not necessary that, like, you know, there is a, a, a target in Mabada alone. We can eliminate it will not work, and we have a like you know we already they set up one three five you know party and but also like you know Tima Wantanu, all this stuff and uh, and uh, lucky lucky that like you know and I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with all the youth youth leaders and they are very passionate about you know like you know uh, this map mapata you know like uh, and uh, uh, aim protection of religion. That is like protection of religion is the what, the phrase that like it kind of making everybody feel like they need to support Wuyetu. They need to support Mabata. And, and, and you see lots of people who are using the same language, right? Amyo Bada Thadana, protecting Amyo Bada Thadana, who might not actually support Mabatha as an organization, right, who see different ways of doing that. And some see a more extreme anti-Muslim path. Um, some see, you know, a path that doesn't engage negatively with other religions. It's just a kind of internal struggle for that. So I think there's a lot of variation there. The other thing that we found really interesting, um, and we think it's important kind of analytically for us to understand, although to be critical of, is during interviews with some of the, the kind of um, public relations Mabatha monks, um, I, I asked them, I said, well, look, we're, we're reading all your journals, Takithwe, and things like that, and, and we also wanted to know what you would suggest we read to kind of understand Mabatha. Um, what, are there sermons that we should listen to? Are there particular monks that we should listen to? Um, and they sort of smiled. They said, oh, this is a really difficult question, actually, because really there's almost nothing that is sort of the official stance of Mabata, right? So they would not say this monk, when he's giving a sermon, is speaking as a member of Mabata, right? Or, and they said, oh, in, in our journals, sometimes we include things from people that we might not completely agree with, but we, you know, we feel that they're working for Amyo Bada Tadana, and, and so we should include them, or we feel, you know, we have to include them for some sort of obligation. And there's something disingenuous about that, right? I mean, they, they want to be able to claim that any monk or any person working on behalf of Amyo Bada Tadana is a Mabata monk, right, on the one hand, up and until that person does something that's problematic or crosses a line or whatever, and then they say, no, 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 that's not us, right? And But that's also that, that also reflects the, the savvy of the organization as well. It, it has been able to be kind of agile and flexible to capture so much of what's going on there. And, and I think, you know, we're already starting to see, along with that diversification, you get these these different groups that some, you know, some will break off, some will focus on other things, some will continue to act under this, you know, Buddha Dhamma Prahita Foundation umbrella, some will become more independent. You know, you're just going to see a lot of that diversification as 
sort of Myanmar's political and religious fields diversify um, and become sort of more institutionalized as well. I think it's, at the moment is a very interesting power struggle between Mahana and Mabata plus those who are not affiliated with Mabata but feel like they need to support Mabata and they need to question Mahana. So like, you know, there's a very contestation of, you know, like, I know, the power. Because of Mahana, even though there's, like, you know, supreme authority, and yet there's, like, they have its own flaw. Right? Is it um, often associated as or it's a rubber stamp for the military in the past sort of things? That... Um, and it's foundation, you could say that. The foundation was, uh, um, of course, military actually create this Mahana so that like, they can control monks who are politically activists and who have been supporting political movement in the past, particularly after 2008, the Southern Revolution. So, like, you know, so that this Mahana is creation of military to control and divide, divide and control monks' population. Buying, providing, gift, and titles. That is like, you know, what many people believe in it. So many also question about, you know, we, if we think that, it's a, we can think that, okay, Mahana is the supreme monastic administration, so they should be able to control. This is not the case. Because like, uh, 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 among the monks, they have been questioning about Mahana. Right? Like, and so, and so that is a one problem. Second problem is that now, as Matt said, that like in, in within the Mabata, there's like a lot of division. And also recently, like I know, uh, the religious minister saying that, in a way that like, in some way that there is a clever step that like Mabata or any association that associate with Mabata or not cannot use a flag. Or their publication should be like, kind of, you know, carefully censored. So that is like a, kind of another step that NLD government is trying to do something. But it is like, you know, they, why they are trying to do this, the division between Mahana and Mabata and other uh, monastic order is still also dangerous. And I think this scares people a lot, right? So, so there are a couple of things. I mean, I, I, um, I, mean, every, I completely agree with everything that you said about, about that history. And one of the weird things is then you think about, okay, well, what does it mean now that the NLD government is in power, right? And, and probably what it suggests is that is that Mahana is and has always been a mouthpiece for the government or for the authority, right? Because now it does seem like the NLD religious ministry has has control over it. But it's also just, in general, a conservative body, right? It's always been worried more, I, I think, about the image of Buddhism, the perception of Buddhism, rather than you know, any, anything else. Right. So, so we don't, we don't really know if Mahana monks, um, who, who might've said something uh, about the 2008 protests, uh, or sorry, 2007 protests, um, or even in 88, we don't know if they were pro-military as much as they were just anti-monks being out in the street, which is, you would expect old monks to be very conservative in, in those kinds of things. So, you know, but the upshot of this is that, the idea that there are these splits within the Buddhist community, within the highest, most respected ranks of the Buddhist community, is terrifying to Buddhist people, right? I mean, that is another thing that is is really important. You know, nobody really remembers what was happening in the 30s and 50s in terms of their personal memories. But, I mean, all the records that we, we have that, you know, there were pitched battles between leftist and rightist groups of monks in the streets and things like that. And so, and, and, and that still has happened within relatively recent memory in Sri Lanka and, and, and in Thailand in, in the 70s. And this is a scary thing for a lot of people, but it's also a part of the analysis of the Mabatha Buddhist nationalism phenomenon that hasn't really made it into much of, 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 the, of the public analysis too. So it's really interesting that purification, that is the very contested, like purification by the religious minister who has been accused of being corrupt. And purification of the monks, and uh, and uh, like it is not easy to purify. So like again, <laughs> because uh, that's uh, like I know you know these monks are coming from different walks of life. And the second thing is that almost all monks and nuns told me that trying to be a monk how difficult it is. It is true they have to follow two hundred twenty seven rules. 
in modern time. So that's like a kind of when religious minister as well as Mahana saying purification, what does it mean? How will it work? You know, like, and, and they are one of the reason, very clear reason for them is that decline of monks population. That is a like, that is, they have a like an effectual reason. Decline of monks population, decline of novice population. You know, so actually that, that is one hand. Second hand is like, you know, purification. So that is like very conflicting. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, I, so touching on some of the stuff that was in there about diversity and, and things like that, we'll take it in another direction. Like you mentioned earlier, um, a significant part of the project focuses on the ways that gender is interwoven in the religious politics of Burma. Uh, from my perspective, thinking about these issues and what I've read in the media, the, it's most clearly manifest in this um, discourse about the so-called protection of Buddhist women from supposed threats from other religions um, where does that particular discourse come from and how is gender relevant to all of this? I think that is not new. Right? It's actually, in, 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 even in the case of Burma, it happened in the 1930s, colonial era. You know, Burmese women, for instance, in Rangoon, there's a foreigner outnumber Burmese. And women outnumber men at the time in Rangoon. So, you know, and then the mixed marriage, was particularly targeted because a mixed marriage will produce non-Buddhist population. That's a like again. So that is a, and, and we all know that you know our private public sphere and woman body reproductive thing. And so like again, you know, women are the one is like the gatekeeper of purity of the race. Like it kind of you know when they are thinking about monks are the one gatekeeper, secret guard mm-hmm. of the you know religious. You know, uh, religious security, but women are the one gatekeeper, you know, and uh, and uh, 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 boundary marker of the pure Buddhist race. So that's actually the really this this is a very dangerous because we have seen it in nineteen thirty eight, nineteen thirty eight. Indo Burma rival was particularly because of women, right? Like again, it's a mixed marriage. Indian marriage into Burmese women, and still away Burmese women. So that is a, and from Buddhist race, that is a, like you know major fear, the main fear that created 1938 in the Burma riot. Now it's like you're coming back. Now, let's face it, this is transition time. In Burma, there's like you know, all f- forms of races and languages, and people are doing business, and and Burmese men also feel they are being left out. They say like, and, and, and they, are, they are not insecure of their position and the traditional rules. The changes of traditional rules, they can no longer be able to provide the monks. Like, so, and uh, they are losing Buddhist lay population. Women, who are the ones who is supporting monks' welfare by providing food and arms? So they say, like, and I said, all of them created, uh, uh, women are held responsible to protect their own sexualities. And not to mix to them, to their and race from a do a man from other ways, particularly Muslim. So actually, this justification is dangerous for women. So there is a lot of, you know, you know that's why you know that 2015 there yeah, are new law of um, marriage law was able to uh, and uh, and announce that marriage law is already exist in Burma. Plus, like uh, you know, women who actually have relationship with the Western uh, uh, Muslim people are considered as purely just trying Burmese Buddhist. So that actually linked to can link to gender violence. Yeah, and I think I think the only other thing to add, just talking about transition, um, I mean, connected to a perceived lack of opportunity or status for Burmese men is the creation of a whole new set of opportunities for Burmese women, right? I mean, we think about just that it's it's still a relatively small popu- percentage of the population of women who are accessing higher education abroad or working for NGOs or having high profile um, positions and being, you know, primary wage earners in their families. But these, you know, this, th- this I think will continue to be a growing phenomenon. And so I think having that as well, challenging 
traditional hierarchical roles. I, I was um, just reading something that, that uh, there was a Kite Tales profile on um, a woman who said, you know, I was taught that when I get married, my husband is God and my son will be my master, right? This is a sort of traditional idea. She was like, I, psst, that's not going to be me, right? And and so so the ways in which in which women are challenging a lot of those traditional um, roles, I think, is also a source of of anxiety for for men, and you know whether it's whether it's laymen or men in p political authority, or you know, or even monks who find themselves in conversations with women that are conducted just in in ways that they wouldn't have even imagined twenty years ago in terms of informality. It's right? really interesting that like um um and uh, in the world, if we look at gender term, right, like more and more women are working and they are achieving education higher than men. It's, I'm not talking about here is gender, but there's a factual figure that like you kind know, of more women are educating compared to men and it's like and we can actually looking at the trend of gender is changing the whole world right like you kind know, of so men die earlier than women so another factor the whole world but in the case of burma is like you kind know, of these experience are very new and very challenging and and so actually even women are not dominated in the position of decision making. And yet, that is, and yet, like in politics, for example, Burma had the lowest female political representation in the region until now. Now, second lowest in the region. And yet, like this is like a kind of, that's a new phenomenon. But I would say that because as a gender scholar working on Burma history and anthropology across for many years, I would say that Burmese women had the position, equal position with men. It has been destroyed and eliminated by the colonial era, right? So, and plus military era. Burma had longer militarization in the region. Military, military, militarism is always extreme form of patriarchy. The influence of militarization, prolonged militarization on gender, in as a, a kind of creating a lot of imbalance of power between men and women. And that's where we'll stop episode one of this two-part episode. Make sure you download and listen to part two, where we'll go on to discuss gender in a little more detail and then go to methodology, fieldwork, and recommendations. <laughs>